This is Team Tattoo. And of course, you know, our featured speaker tonight is Reverend Aswad. We also have uh, helping to hold it down, Reverend Taliba and uh, Reverend Candia and myself. And, and, and we're gonna take you there once again, not just now we look at our history up to 2000, Reverend Aswad is gonna take us to the present, bring us to the present and into the future. And before we begin the presentation, I'd like to ask everyone to pray along with me, assume a posture of prayer. Almighty God, cosmic energy and creative intelligence, we thank you for this day in our lives. We thank you for this gathering and we pray that you bless each and every soul that is here and bless those that would like to be here but and could not be. We pray a, a special prayer for our sister Inko Sasana and her recently departed son who is now on his way to the ancestral realm. We pray, pray that you bless the family and be with them mm -hmm. as they process the transfer, as they process this transition, and we pray that you be with his spirit as he journey, journeys to the land of the ancestors. We pray that you help us to be fortified by the information and the fellowship uh, presented here today, and that it invigorate us in the work that we have before us as Black Christian nationalists as we seek to restore our people to our traditional greatness. We pray these things and all in the name of the revolutionary Black Messiah, we say our shade and our amen. 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 I give you Reverend a swipe. Unmute yourself. You are, bro. You can't talk if you can't if we can't hear you. So, all right. So hopefully everyone can see this screen. Yeah, just go to slide mode. There it is. Okay, so. This is week four of um, presenting the history of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. And there's really no way to do that in just four weeks. But I do want to give a shout out to the presenters for the past three weeks. Uh, they've done an incredible job um, linking so much of our story that came before our fellowship and showing how that transition continues continues on. So I just just much appreciative of, of their, their great work. But this is how, how it's going down today. So we'll have this formal presentation. Um, and I'm welcoming questions and comments as we go along. Uh, that presentation will cover three main areas, uh, past influences that are alive and well today in the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church or PAOCC. Uh, the present impact of our movement, and then the future is now. What are we doing now that has implications for a preferred future of self-determination for our people? And we'll, we'll conclude with um, a discussion on ways to take action right now that allow us to make history today. So let's, let's do it. So like I said, uh, past influences that are alive right now, individuals, um, ideas, scientific discoveries, all those different things that have influenced the evolution of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church's theology. And that's critical because theology, uh, the way I define it is it answers four questions. What you believe about God, humanity, so the process of salvation, and the role of religion or the church or the mosque or the temple. Your answer to those four questions present your theology. And that's critical because as my, my former group leader, Major Coloma was fond of saying, um, as I believe, so I do. What you believe dictates your actions. So if you believe that we are supposed to be enslaved, your actions will be that of someone who is enslaved. If you believe that we are supposed to be uh, bending our knee to no one but God, then your actions will show that. But what, as we believe, so we do. So the theology of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church is just so critically, foundationally important. Okay, so what are some of those things that, you know, old, ancient, past ideas, individuals, et cetera, that are alive and well today. There are several. I'm just going to run down a few. 
First off, we're talking about ancient African religious systems alive and well, with the first one being Mayat out of ancient Egypt, the spiritual ethical uh, traditions of that land. We know about the seven cardinal virtues of truth, justice, propi propriety, excuse me, harmony, balance, reciprocity, and order. And if we, we could do a whole class on any one of those and how we see uh, the essence of, or the importance of truth, the importance of justice and balance in the, the programs and the theology and the mission of the pan african Orthodox Christian Church. But I want you to check out three of the basic tenets of Mayat, and there are more than three, but just check out these three. Humans as the divine image of God, the inherent dignity of the human being, standing worthy before God and the people. Do we see, does anyone see any connection between those basic tenets of Mayat and what it is we believe in the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church? Well, yes. Go ahead and share. Humans, as a divine image of God, we are in, uh, we are in, uh, the, um, in the image and likeness of God. And as gods, uh, we, uh, we should be determining our own destiny. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If, if, if we believe that God is a God of justice, then we're supposed to be about justice. If we, we believe God is creative intelligence, then we are supposed to be creative and striving for intelligence. If it's a God of love, then we are supposed to show and exude love. Humans as the divine image of God and also the inherent dignity of the human being. You don't have worth and value because of who you're dating, because of what shoes you wear or what side of town you live on. You have an inherent dignity because it was given to you by almighty God. That's, that's what our ancient um, ancestors believe. That's what we believe right now. And then standing worthy before God and the people that we have a responsibility that goes beyond ourselves that each of us has been given a divine mission a, a calling that we are supposed to show through the actions that we take with our lives so that we can stand worthy before God and with the people because we're called to serve both God and and our people so that's out of ancient Mayat but you could also go to West Africa ancient Yoruba land and Ifa in the spiritual traditions there the inherent goodness of the world. Uh, you, read, you don't even have to read far in the Bible to see that. Just open it up to page one of Genesis. God made this and it was good. God made that and it was good. God made the other and it was good. Then you go to the chosen status of humans. We have been given uh, dominion uh, or responsibility to be caretakers of God's creation. And then finally, the human right to a good life. You have a right to be treated with respect. You have a right to health and happiness and, and, and prosperity. And if there are any things, if there are any institutions, individuals, or happenings that are taking place that block you from access to your divine right to a good life, then you are called by Almighty God to stand up and do something about it. And so certainly we can see how these ancient tenets can be found in our current situation. A, a gazillion different examples, but I think there's one saying that kind of summarizes all of it. Nothing is more sacred than the liberation of Black people. You deserve to be treated with respect. You deserve self-determination. You deserve uh, access to health care and education. You deserve a political representation that's gonna look out for your best interests. And if, none of, if that's not happening, then we're putting other things before the liberation of black people. And if the liberation of black people is most important, then we're gonna work to change whatever conditions stand between us in the way God wants us to live. Okay, so that's ancient Africa, but we can go, we can move closer to modern, modern times, the Harlem Renaissance. So the Harlem Renaissance, as it was known by those who were participating in it, 
they called it, they didn't call it the Harlem Renaissance. They called it the new Negro movement because we're talking about black people just 60, 70 years out of enslavement. But they were of the mindset that we are gonna prove both to ourselves and the world that we are so much more than how the world defines us. And we're gonna show excellence through the arts, excellence through so social commentary, through community action, through uh, literature, every single way we are gonna show our stuff to the world that we are intelligent and creative and powerful and we have agency. We're gonna show all that. That's the new Negro movement. And one of the people who, one of the driving forces behind the uh, Harlem Renaissance as, as it's known, beyond Marcus Garvey was this brother right here, Alan Locke, who doesn't get enough credit or shine for what he, for what he did. Alan Locke believed that art in the Great Migration, but mainly art, not political protest, but art was the key to Black progress and Black liberation. I'm just really curious to know if anyone, our, our thoughts on that. Do you think Alan Locke was crazy or do you think he had a point when he's talking about the importance of art? I think Elaine Locke brought forth a, an amazing creative force allowed it to be unleashed, whether it was Zora Neale, whether it was Langston, whether it was the, the growth of black theater movements in every place that black people lived that gave our souls a place to be. Yeah, yeah, you thank know, you for that. Um, yeah, I don't think we think enough about the relationship between art and spirituality and the creator. Earlier, you mentioned us being uh, like God and being creative intelligence and cosmic energy. But each and every, uh, each and every one of us as co-creators, so to speak, that creative intelligence that manifests in us is one of the ways that we can be like God. So to yeah. tap into that spirit which I think is the source of all creativity, mm -hmm. it, it kind of lends to uh, us being like God in a way that was maybe not even spoken of in the context of the Harlem Renaissance. So that's, I think, superly important and relevant to who we are as we uh, uh, advocate for and strive for reaching our inner divinity through the best self theology. Yeah, and and thank, thank you for that. And like our presiding bishop um, is known to say, a human being cannot operate outside of their CPU, their central processing unit. Whatever it is you believe, that then defines the parameters of the things that you can do. In other words, if you can't see it, you cannot achieve it. And that's one of the powers of art, whether it's paintings or dance or song or poetry, um, these things, paint a picture, or can, at least can, paint a picture of a preferred future. It can open up your mind to new possibilities and new realities. And if your mind opens up to those new realities, then there are new possibilities for you. So art is a, it, it, it's powerful. Um, yeah, gotta keep it moving. And these are three examples, right? Um, we see these, these, these beautiful murals of the black Madonna and child and we probably take them for granted. Um, but if we recall the moment when we first saw, uh, we might remember just how impactful they continue to be, opening up new possibilities. Um, I teach a class at UH and I'm, I'm always um, uh, making my, my students come to church, uh, giving them extra credit. But, um, and I'm thinking that they're gonna be moved by a powerful word by the fellowship, by the music, and they and maybe they are. But the thing they talk about the most are these, these, these this black icon, religious iconography, the images that they had just never even imagined before walking into uh, the sanctuary of the, of the shrines of the Black Madonna. And then to have institutions that traffic in the arts, that, that, that deal with the arts, whether it's, it's paintings or clothing, um, jewelry, etc., or spoken word, 
in the form of um, presentations. I mean, we've had everyone who's ever thought about doing something positive for black people come through our doors. Dr. Francis Tress Wilson, uh, Brother Dick Gregory, uh, both ancestors now, uh, Dr. Dr. Boyce uh, Watkins, and a, a gazillion more. Or, or the and, and Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Naomi right. Magic Long, who wrote for us for our Jubilee. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Betty Shabazz, Susan Taylor, um, anyone that stood up for Black people at any point in, in our history has been through our doors in some shape, form, or fashion. And it, it just has a powerful effect, but it goes, it's the buy Black market, but it's beyond simply the buy Black market. An another thing that, uh, that we can see alive and well today, uh, modern scientific discoveries. And when I say modern, I'm going back to the 1800s because, you know, humans have a long timeline or historic timeline. So when I'm talking about modern scientific discoveries, I'm, I'm going back to the 1800s. But the law, the first law of thermodynamics, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That's one. The morphogenetic field, this invisible reality that provides the framework for our tangible reality. It's also that the field that connects members of a group of species, and we're familiar with it when we talk about the, the story of the hundredth monkey and the importance of building that critical mass. But the, but the point is, we had, we had a founder who was not a slave to the fixed mindset. He had a growth mindset. So he was always willing to take in new information and new ideas and wrestle with them so that he was open to having an emerging or evolving theology rather than one that was fixed in, 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 in well, hell, just fixed. Um, but these are some of those ideas that he was open to and we see them in our theology today because we define God in terms of energy that whole thing, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. We say that's God. God is cosmic energy, creative intelligence. And we also talk about healing as an energy reality. Um, every time we have Woke Wednesdays, uh, my sister, Sister Muhammad up there, she talks about healing through energy. That, that's one of the most consistent things I hear her say. Who are the science of becoming who and what we already are chakra therapy, yoga, movements, a church being open to that. That was us back in the 70s and the 60s. Churches used to shun that. Now all, you, you can find uh, yoga classes and, and Tai Chi classes. You can find that in, in a whole lot of black churches now, but that's because of the impact of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian church. If we believe in energy realities, folk don't even have to be um, don't have to walk through our doors to be impacted by our theology and by our program. And then also the focus on communalism, relationships, group process, all those deal with energy. And y'all know how it is. When the energy is right, when you have good relationships, when you help someone and you get that good feeling from helping someone or someone helps you, prays for you, that energy then opens up even more doors of possibility. For, for you, for your movement. Then the whole, the whole quantum theology. Uh, there's a book by that, by, that, by that term, but that speaks to the openness to um, science and religion not being contradictory, but being co-partners in, in life. Uh, that was a radical, radical idea that even today, many people um, shun. They either believe in science or they believe in religion. But what we have been saying, which is very similar to our African ancestors, is they are all, they're all one. And then I've already mentioned the critical mass. Um, commun communalism and community building. That's about as ancient as you can get it. Um, this idea that we can do more together than we can apart or Ubuntu, I am because we are and because we are, therefore I am. We have a long and storied history of participating in community building. I wanna give you just one example from 
what is it, 10, 11 years ago, right here in Houston. So the, the, the shrines of the Black Madonna in Houston, we reside on Martin Luther King Boulevard. And there's been several comedians who make the joke, no matter what city you go to, whenever you go to Martin Luther King Boulevard, that is the most dangerous place in the city. Um, and so the only development that had happened on our stretch of MLK Boulevard was the development that our church brought. Uh, we purchased the, the sanctuary, developed the uh, cultural center, that used to be a bowling alley. Um, we bought uh, apartment complexes across the street that were havens for, for drugs and crime and turned them into missionary training institutes. Uh, we made a difference in the community, but beyond that, there was not much going on. Um, our presiding bishop, uh, Jeremo Jikimathi, heard about uh, the city with its plans to uh, build rail uh, so that, you know, folk, folk could get around, map mass transit. Um, they weren't thinking about coming down MLK Boulevard because hell, to them, nothing was going on on MLK Boulevard. Uh, but our presiding bishop said, you know, if we are able to get that rail to come down here, we can revitalize this entire community uh, there'll be all kinds of investment, uh, individuals, institutions, businesses that come our way and can transform, transform our, our neighborhood. And so we called it the Upper MLK Revitalization Project. The mission was to, you know, recognizing that we couldn't do it by ourselves. The mission was to create a partnership between community, business, government, all working together in a coordinated effort to create the kind of positive community, safe community that we all want. Now, there were some folk who, who came along kicking and screaming. There were some folk who said, we want no part of it. But the result has been this. There was a school that was going to close down on MLK. When they saw what was going on and the development coming, they knocked down the old institution <coughs> and built up an entirely new school. Uh, and it's one of, the, one of the shining lights in all of the Houston Independent School District. But not only that, we attracted Kip Liberation to come across the street. So uh, the first development, school development in our community in over 30 years, that was two things. There was an, a YMCA um, in another part of town that was looking to relocate. When they heard about what was going on on Martin Luther King Boulevard, they decided to relocate there. But not only that, the Houston Texans, the football team said, we want to partner with that YMCA, making it the first um, NFL football team and YMCA partnership in the entire country. There was a library that was, it was it's even a shame to call it a library because it was so small. They were looking to relocate. They were trying to move out of the neighborhood. There was like, there's nothing going on here. But when they saw what was happening with the upper MLK revitalization project, they said, we'll just get a bigger space right here because this is the place to be. And after that, just all sorts of things began to come our way. There's a dorm uh, right down on the corner that houses students, not just from one university, but two, University of Houston and Texas Southern and so many more. But this was a vision that the presiding bishop had that this can be a template for how we can affect change so that how churches or any institution can affect change beyond just preaching a word, let's work together in Ubuntu and we can bring some changes. But there are other ways that we build community. Uh, the fact that we are participating right now on Woke Wednesdays through the virtual village, that is an avenue for community building, the incredible worship services that we have on Sunday. And what I find even more powerful and fulfilling are the coffee hours afterwards, where we can talk and laugh and discuss with one another. Uh, the African Speaks, another one of our programming, Conscious Conversation, and so many more ways that we build community. And building community is not just us. We affect energy when we do that. And when we put that in the atmosphere, other people pick it up. These powerful sisters right here, the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, these two sisters right here, 
Latasha Brown, who founded Black Voters Matter. She's one of those elite y'all down in Georgia. You know all about Latasha Brown because she was one of the, those folk who were so responsible for Georgia just showing out during this past election. And then uh, Cori Bush, she was a, an activist in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, her activism and community building led to her now being um, in the US House of Representatives. But again, an, another example of just when we do the work ourselves, the energy will touch others. Community, communalism, I am because we are. And it went out to Stockton, California and touched this young brother right here named Michael Tubbs. He's the mayor. And he pulled back into his historic bag and he found where Dr. Martin Luther King years ago was talking about a guaranteed income, that if we can give uh, people a, 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 a guaranteed income, so many of the issues, problems that folk have, they won't have it anymore. They, have the, they will have the wherewithal to deal with them. Because as y'all know, there is a steep price. It's a high cost for being poor. And, and Dr. King's idea was if we give folk a guaranteed income, so many of those small problems will be alleviated. This brother started it off out in Stockton, California, but now you have cities and municipalities all over the country that are trying to do the same thing, trying to figure out how can we together as a city, as a community, make our, our city safer for everybody. That's communalism. And then there's those proponents of Pan-Africanism. Uh, Edward Wilmot Blyden, uh, the brother in the middle, Henry Highland Garnett, and the brother um, all the way to the right, Martin Delaney, powerful Pan-Africanists, um, as well as um, our patron saint, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. But their ideas, their thoughts are alive and well through the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. The primacy of Africa and African history, every, every region is teaching African history. Uh, the, the recognition that we are in an international struggle Umoja, we are an African people. Our struggle isn't different in the United States than it is in South America than it is on the continent. We're all struggling for the empowerment of our people. The importance of black religious iconography. We get that one straight from Marcus Mosiah Garvey. 1924 declared Mary the black Messiah and Jesus the black man of sorrows. And Garvey also focused on institution building and then the concept of God. You know, our concept of God, cosmic energy and creative intelligence. Garvey literally said those exact same words back in the 1920s. And if you were to join Garvey's movement, the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, you were then enrolled in its catechism classes where they taught the theology of the movement. They taught that this is how we believe about God and Jesus and salvation. This is what we believe. And it is calling us to act, to build power, to stand against uh, the mistreatment and oppression of our people. And we see that because of hell, we're in a class right now. But throughout our, our 60 plus, almost 70 year history, we've had all kinds of catechism classes. We've called them different things but all of them have been teaching us the theology of the movement, that this isn't just some good political idea or educational idea. This is a divine spiritual calling, a divine spiritual movement. And we see this, uh, the fruits of that Pan-Africanist Pan -Africanist influence in the PAOCC Liberia, that picture is from Ganta, and in the great works of one of our own, uh, Reverend Dr. Jawanza Clark, his book, Indigenous Black Messiah, excuse me, Indigenous Black Theology, that talks about the critical importance of ancestor veneration. Uh, when I, I went to some conference some years ago in Minneapolis, uh, some progressive conference, and we all had roommates, I roomed with a brother named um, Jamie Wooten out of Baltimore. And when he found out that I was from the shrine, one of the first questions he asked me was, do you know Dr. Eric Jawanza Clark? Uh, we may not know, this young brother, this brother is a rock star in the, in the growing <laughs> number of progressive black 
theologians. Uh, and he's teaching black Christian nationalism. God bless him. And then this willingness to defend all these ideas alive and well. We can go back to the Hebrews taking and securing the promised land. Mattathias and Sons, their defense of their, their town of Modin. Queen and Zenga, Joseph Sinke or Singbe, Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Prosser, Nat Turner, Ya Asantwe, Ida B. Wells, and her, 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 her drive against the lynching of our people. The Camp Logan soldiers right here in Houston, Texas, and their armed march on the Houston Police Department for their mistreatment of black people, the UNIA's African Legion, the Deacons of Defense during the 1960s, the Black Panther Party for self-defense, all examples of our willingness to defend, recognizing that we are the children of God, just like anybody else. We have a right to health, happiness, prosperity, and thus we must mm. defend our, our, our spouses, our children, our communities, our institutions, and of course, the Holy Order of the Maccabees. It, it's it's a it's a it's it's a thread throughout throughout time, and then those biblical concepts of feed my sheep, heal the sick, raise the dead. We see those in a million different ways throughout our history, right? The community service centers and the law centers, Imhotep Medical Clinic, the West End Learning Center, uh, the Kugasana Medical Clinic, the Albert B. Cleek Senior Medical Clinic, uh, the General Masai Field House. Beulah Land, the Aquaba Community Service Center, the Tree of Love Prison Ministry, Pan-African Ministries. Here in Houston, housed 200 families that were displaced by Hurricane Katrina. And years before that, we were the headquarters for the entire city for those who wanted to send relief efforts to both Rwanda and Haiti that were going through hell in the 90s. But we don't even have to go that far back. We can talk about the Detroit food pantry that's happening right now. We can talk about the food pantry in Atlanta that's going on right now. Or we can talk about the food giveaway that's happening in Houston right now. This idea of feeding our sheep. And I, I, I remember uh, uh, Judge Stevens talking about uh, Father Divine and talking about meeting the needs of the people. That's what, that's what we do. That's what we've been called to do. Politics as sacred. Um, the voice, it's a long quote, I'm not going to go ahead and read that, but the voice was talking long ago about how important it is to be in the political game. And then I was looking for a picture on the black slate, went online and just happened to run across this photo of Cardinal Muthamaki from Detroit. I didn't realize <laughs> that he had been um, interviewed for an, for an article by NBC. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to say he's big time. But there he was and is on the front lines trying to get people out to vote, involved in the political process. But like I said before, the energy that we put out affects and impacts others. It's not just us. So when we talk about our history, we are not just celebrating what we do. We're celebrating what other folk do that were touched by that history. Latasha Brown, I've already mentioned her, of Black Voters Matter. Stacey Abrams of Fair Fight. Why do you think all these people are getting involved and, and activated? It's because of the work that you did, that we have done throughout our, our, our decades. And so what is the present impact, the modern day impact of the shrines of the Black Medallion, the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church? One of those is an educational emphasis of uh, uh, Lord have mercy, we have attracted um, educators since our doors opened. But not only have we attracted educators, uh, we have actively sent folk to school to learn this, that, and the other, to bring that information back and strengthen our, our movement. These are just some examples of the, of the folk. And I know I'm gonna get, get in trouble for showing their pictures because for every picture I put up there, I'm leaving out 10, 15, 20 people. Uh, but I just wanted you to, to recognize that when we're talking about the educational greatness, we're not talking about folk we don't know. We're talking That's about true. you. We're talking about us. We're talking about people we know. Another example of our educational push was the African-American Quad Centennial. Because we made that an issue 
and we made that a big deal, there were countless organizations, mosques, temples, churches, uh, universities that began talking about it because we made so much noise about the importance of, the, of commemorating the African-American quad centennial. Um, and the noise that we made impacted uh, this good sister here who won all kinds of awards for the New York Times 1619 project. In fact, our presiding bishop had direct conversations with her pre preceding, that, uh, preceding that project. Also in 2019, um, our presiding bishop was called, was invited to uh, participate in the commemoration of the Elaine, um, Arkansas massacre, uh, which happened, uh, I guess, in, excuse me, in 1919. But, and I'm showing that just to give you an example of how um, our educational focus impacts others it impacts others to have those conversations that we need to have so that we can know our whole history, our entire, our entire story. Okay, gotta, gotta speed it up here. Then we have progressive scholarship. Because of our educational emphasis, we see more and more scholars who are not selling out our people, but they're coming from a Pan-African progressive perspective. We see it in uh, Ibram Kendi's book, in his work, Stamped from the Beginning. The incredible works of Isabel Wilkerson, Past and the Warmth of Other Sons, Michelle Alexander's uh, The New Jim Crow. But with progressive scholarship, then becomes more progressive social commentary. So we're reading and studying from a Pan African perspective. Then we begin talking and speaking and demanding from a Pan African perspective. And you see it in books by Tanahisi Coates and Eddie Glaud, Jr and Stacey Abrams, but not just in books, you also see it through the media. You see more and more black people speaking from a black perspective from the media, whether you go to theroot.com or whether you turn on MSNBC to the readout or, or the cross connection or Sunday, the Sunday show with John Capehart, or you go online to the Grio, but you can find positive, powerful, Pan-African perspective stories, they, but they didn't come out of anywhere. They came from the energy that you put out there when you were doing that missionary outreach work. The energy that you put out when you were on assignment um, with them total house and the Keebaland, when you were pulling post, when you were doing those things, you were putting out energy that was opening our people up to becoming more positive, more progressive, and looking out for our interests. And then one thing um, that I think we don't give enough attention to is the fact that we have survived a transition in leadership. Uh, the question here, what do the following organizations have in common? Uh, the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, Republic of New Africa, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Council on Racial Equality, what do they have in common? After their leader left or passed or circum whatever, they either faded into obscurity or they stopped operating altogether. That's always been the danger of black organizations. Our, our movement has survived the leadership transition from our beloved founder, the Honorable Jeremoji, Abebe Ajman to our presiding bishop, Jeremoji Menelik Kimafi. And we need to have way more love and respect for the fact that as an organization, as a movement, we were and are healthy enough to have made that, made that transition. We have a holy patriarch. He's been, he's been in that position for 21 years. It's kind of hard to believe, kind of mind blowing. And then we have Beulah Land, and I'm not going to talk about Beulah Land because Beulah Land deserves a class by itself. But I just wanted to mention it, but we gotta keep it moving. So where does that bring us? It brings us to the future. The future impact of our movement depends on the history that we make today. Y'all already know we've been celebrating this. The National Park Service added the Shrine of the Black Madonna to the National Register of Historic Places. We should pat ourselves on the back. We should sing and shout. 
That's something to be proud about. But I'm telling you, we are far from finished making history. We've got all kinds of ways that we can and will do that. We have a cadre of revolutionary theologians, revolutionary, progressive, African-centered theologians uh, who, who know who uh, uh, Reverend Albert B. Cleague Jr., Jeremo Jabebe Ajman was and is to us, um, who recognize that right now, Reverend Jeremiah Wright is considered the uh, authority on black liberation theology. But there are some young sisters and brothers coming up who recognize this, who honor this, and they honor it not just by their words, but by their deeds. Like this brother here, Reverend Heber, Reverend Dr., excuse me, Heber Brown III out of Baltimore, who leads the, uh, the church farm project, who is feeding thousands and thousands, who's supporting uh, black farmers, and he's supporting uh, the building of urban gardens. He's just doing an incredible, incredible work. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Crumpton um, up in Chicago, I believe, doing powerful, powerful work. The brother in the bow tie, he was one of the brothers that was um, ordained the last time we all got together down in Atlanta, Reverend Ronnie Galvin. Uh, the brother seated, uh, Jamie Wooten in Baltimore. He leads the Black Theology Project. It's, it's a, it's a um, well, one aspect of it is a website where <clears throat> it's like a storehouse for progressive, powerful black thought, black religious thought. Um, you need to check that out. He's he's the guy, he's the brother that was a, a big fan of Dewanza, but he's an even bigger fan of Reverend Albert B. Cleek Jr. In fact, selling uh, Reverend Cleek T-shirts actually. The brother with the Vote Now shirt, Reverend Dr. Earl Fisher in um, Memphis, Tennessee, and Dr. Kelly Douglas. Uh, I can't remember her entire name. But, but she of the book, she wrote a book entitled Stand Your Ground uh, from a religious perspective. The point I'm trying to make is it's not just the folk that we see on these calls. It's not just the folk that come to church virtually or we see in coffee hour. We have a, we have a network that is growing and it is powerful and they are some bad sisters and brothers. And it's also shown the future of our, our, our movement. It's also shown in the growing by black movement. When I say buy black movement, I'm not just talking about the, the buy black marketplace. I'm talking about student athletes in high school that are making the decision. Every month we hear about another student athlete that's choosing to go to an HBCU rather than one of these uh, predominantly white institutions because they believe at an HBCU, there's gonna be people there looking out for my best interest. That's where I can learn about my history, heritage and culture. But you also see it in this proliferation of black owned media companies, Viola Davis, Michael P. Jordan, Issa Rae, Halle Berry, Oprah Winfrey, Tyler Perry, LeBron James, Jordan Peele, Ava DuVernay, and many more. We wondering why we see in all these new black shows and movies that are celebrating our history and story and that are opening eyes. It's because black folk are saying, we've got to own our own production companies. We're gonna tell our stories because no one can tell our stories the way we can. That's, that's just one aspect of this growing by black movement and celebrities that are actively, actively supporting uh, black owned businesses. And this energy is infecting our children. This young lady right here started when she was eight years old, making her own wing sauce, then started selling it a few years later. Now she has her wing sauce in 70 stores across the country, just 17 years old. She's the CEO of a company you can pat yourself on the back for her being open to that, uh, willing to go um, where, the, where the spirit led her. And then, hey man, I, I love turning on MSNBC. That's where I get most of my news. But what about MSBCN? We can have our own network. I mean, networks depend, one of the main things they need is programming. We got the programming. Of course, we can get better but we, we can improve what we have and we can add to it. And there's no reason we shouldn't have our own network so that we can broadcast BCN on the frequency of freedom to everywhere on the planet. And then there's Beulah Land that is, can serve as a template for self-determination. And so I've talked myself out, I'm gonna 
hand the mic over to Reverend Candia so we can talk about ways to make history now. Uh, with, the, with the time that we have left, what can we do so that we are continuing in making history that will lead to, to a better future? Wow. <laughs> can you stop the screen share? Oh, well, I, I, I can definitely do that. Well, I tell you what, Reverend Swad, you, you could have kept going. You were on the road, brother. I was, you, got, you got me fired up. Is everybody fired up right now after that one? Yeah. I, I, I can only imagine MSBCN, yeah, man. right? Uh, you know, we're talking ways to make history now, and I think that there's no better segue than to even lead with the concept of MSBCN. You talk about creative intelligence, right? Cosmic energy and creative intelligence. Uh, Reverend Swad certainly do with that. Uh, but as we talk about ways to make history, let, 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 let's have a conversation. I guess it will have to be quick at this point. Um, if, if somebody can just share, just real quickly, examples of, of your level of commitment to express that cosmic energy, creative intelligence um, that would take us into the future. Uh, make history now, if you would. This is Amal. Can I say? Go ahead, Mother Amal. <laughs> we, one of the conversations uh, that our organization has been having is there are a lot of uh, um, HR or, or um, house, house uh, laws that had left the Congress sitting on the desks of, of the senators that, that have not been addressed. Even uh, the, the uh, uh, Floyd, um, they're, 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 I, I, I got a list over there. And we as a church or we as different organizations can come together and do whatever we can to get those laws, those, those house bills into law. That's, mm -hmm. one, that's one thing we could do. But I mean, it sounds like, you know, what you're speaking to is working with other organizations, right, progressive organizations to, you know, drive policy changes. That's uh, that are sitting on lawmakers' desks. Exactly. That's what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody, and I, I don't call folks out, but I will call you up. So uh, is there anybody else would like to share? What are some of the things that we can do? Uh, and, you know, we have assets, right? We can celebrate our history. Uh, promote that we can, you know, take a look at some of the other activities that that we have going on. Uh, you know, Buell Land was mentioned. Uh, you know, our woke Wednesday, our our, our our series that we're doing via uh, the virtual village. Talk a little bit about your participation, active participation in in making history. Starting well, ministries. One of the things that Amar mentioned was uh, the, the political stuff going on in the country. This is a mm -hmm. right time for the expansion of the Black slate. Um, this is perfect in terms of us organizing to do more in terms of the Black slate, in terms of uh, assisting and moving legislation, uh, lobbying in state legislatures, as well as in federal government. We can do that if we just decide to make that one more step over to um, being uh, in the presence or being in front of um, the political policy makers, so on and so forth. But so Black Slate is a, one, another one of the, our institutions that we created that move Black people and the liberation movement got much more closer. And, and another thing we can do is just using our money and our dollars to promote black businesses. You know, it's a lot, just keeping our money, even if we talk about the city of Detroit or whatever your community is, there's a lot of black businesses that are suffering now. And I know a lot of businesses are suffering, but I'm dealing with specifically black businesses. And we need to promote Black businesses are spending more of our dollars to support our own. And I'm just going to say this. This is just your friendly neighborhood lawyer judge. The Black Slate is certainly one of our wonderful offshoots from the church, which is a part of our coalition efforts. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to monopolize the conversation. Um, but who is who's speaking? Can I go? Uh, okay. So I was reading a book by Charles Blow. He's um, a journalist. He talked about um, uh, one of the things that we might consider is to concentrate, concentrate uh, take a few states and concentrate the black black communities into the in those states. You know, people moving back down south, taking over the south politically. And I'm thinking we've got 4,000 acres of land in Beulah land, and maybe that could be another uh, uh, thing that we can consider uh, is, is getting folks down there so that we can, we can start shifting the, the, shifting the, the uh, balance of power in the South. Just a thought. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, how do we, so it's about le- leveraging <laughs> our assets and our institutions to, to build power. Uh, for self-determination and Black liberation. Well said. And also when we talk about coalitions, uh, as a 40 plus year member of the Shrines of the Black Madonna, and also being um, a co-founder of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, an organization that centers food sovereignty and food justice within the Black community, And we also have a partnership or relationship with the Shrines of the Black Madonna in which we have a youth community garden um, teaching young people not just how to grow food, but how we use food as an act of self-reliance and self-determination. And I think that that's very important and that's very historical. So the even food li- the food li- pantry li- we have, li- go ahead. Those programs up um, in, in expanding, right? In, exactly. In participation exactly. In. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I would we... like to say something. Um, okay. I was just um, yeah, one, listening. One, one this last is, one. Yeah, go this ahead. is Sister Chikasha from um, Shrine 9. And I remember uh, you all. We, we talk, uh, in here. Um, Reverend Aswad talked about uh, the foundation that Jeremoji led. You know, laid, and um, Jeremoji Kamaki is carrying it um, out and everything. But one thing that Jeremoji laid out to us was um, how we spent our money. Though you know, it's like he always taught us to be. Uh, in the world, but not of the world, you know, and we got to get back to that and change the mindset of people. And then it wouldn't be a problem in terms of, you know, maybe like where we're spending our money because we, we, we're in tune to where we should be spending our money. So we got to first change our mindset in terms of what's important. To us because we got to bring all of our dollars and our resources back to our nation. I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that. No, no no need to apologize when you, particularly when you're offering such great insight. Um, This is, uh, if if you ain't woke by now, I don't know if you're going to be woke uh, after today's Woke Wednesday discussion. Amen. Um, Let's again thank. Reverend Swad for, for that powerful, that powerful insight. Powerful. Yes, amen. Powerful. Amen. 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 I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tari Kafense, who's going to pray us out. All right, let's give Reverend Swad another round of applause and kudos. Yes. Go ahead. Amen. Very good. good. We, we got to give some love to the group too. We know that you know God is a group experience. So, and this is just the beginning of what's more to come. As it stands, we should have another series of presentations starting next week. And uh, team two has and team uh, the team that went first. So we kind of setting a precedent. And the thing is, we're learning as we go, so it's going to get better and better. Yes, and that's right. Better. And as long as we draw on the power of the group and the God within us, we cannot fail in anything that we do. Absolutely. I'd like to ask Absolutely. that you pray along with us. Almighty God, cosmic energy and creative intelligence, we thank you for this day in our lives. 
we thank you for the words, the information, and the creative intelligence that you allow to flow through our speaker and to come through us as well. We pray that as we come together and commune in a divine fellowship, that you help us to be fortified, intensified, and glorified with your spirit and energy so we can continue the task of building a Black nation strong with power. We pray that you bless our sister in Costa Sana and her family, and you continue to be with us as we go from this place. We pray these things and all in the name of the revolutionary Black Messiah. We say Ashe and Amen. Ashe and Amen. Ashe and Amen. Ashe and amen. All right. Good job, group. Good job. Yeah, good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> put, put me in the game, coach. Put me in the game, coach. <laughs> hey, Shakesha. Hi. Which Shakesha? <laughs> Both. <laughs> I, I know you better give me my keys, Shakesha. Hey, look. I'm a, yo. I've been waiting. I've been waiting to see you face to face again. <laughs> I'm gonna have your, I'm gonna have your keys next time. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye, Bye. Tommy. Hello, hey, my film and sister Oni. See y'all at the book signing on the 28th. On the 28th, three to five. Yep. It's gonna be powerful. Yes, indeed. See y'all.